Uh, these are planning approaches for assessing vulnerabilities and climate adaptation choices. Uh, this is a program that is um, administered by and largely run by, by CERCA. We, we have been pleased to work with CERCA um, on phase two of Resilient Connecticut. The, um, here's the consultant team present today. Uh, so it's Victoria Brutz, Noah Slovin, and me from My Lonely McBroom, and Scott Choquette and Johanna Greenspan Johnston from Dewberry. And you can see right off the bat, you know, what our roles will be today. So four of us will be breakout room facilitators, and also we'll be presenting some of the slides today. And then um, we, we've assigned Noah Slovin to Zoom Logistics, breakout room control, breakout room floater, and, uh, and the Zoom police, essentially, he'll be Zoom policeman as well. Um, so if there's any Challenges, um, I would say reach out to Noah in the chat. If you are having a problem with connection or sound or audio or something, to start with him. And then um, if the, the problem needs, needs more of us to solve, we can, we can do that. Um, as with every uh, meeting that you've been in for the past nine, 10 months, I'm sure by now we all have heard sort of the ground rules. If there's a spectacular technology fail and we all lose connection, wait a few minutes, we'll all log back in. If there is something um, unforeseen that happens or inappropriate, uh, same thing, log back out, wait a few minutes, log back in. And if it's really just one of the presenters that drops off, for example, um, I have a hardwired connection, but if I disappear, but it's only me, stay in the, stay in the meeting, keep going, someone else will pick up the slack and, and kind of take over for me. So that's kind of how we'll navigate through any challenges if they occur. Um, so the objectives for today are to ground truth the CCVI, which we'll be talking about in a few minutes, this new tool that we have that's being developed to assess vulnerabilities. Um, and then discuss which pieces of the CCVI or really which contributors make the most sense for influencing the outcomes and which pieces of the tool make the most sense for future planning. And we'll kind of, you know, we'll dive into those questions and, and, and guide you through how to decide. We'll also take some time to understand the concept of zones of shared risk. We'll do a good history lesson. I was a terrible student in history back in grammar school, but suddenly I don't mind it anymore. So I think a good history lesson for zones of shared risk will help, help set the, the context for, for what we're trying to do. We'll take a look at some preliminary zones of shared risk and then just kind of explain how we're getting positioned for the next steps. This is our time frame. Um, so the main thing to remember is we've got like a 20, 30, 10, 20, 30, 10 pattern here. So after, I'm, after I speak and John Trzynski says a few words in a minute, we'll just go into the CCVI presentation. We'll be 20 minutes, 30 minutes of breakout, followed by 10 minutes of report out. Then we'll repeat the same pattern, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 10 minutes for the zones of shared risk. And I think we'll have enough time at the end for an open discussion or for anything that spills over into, um, you know, that goes long we'll still be out of here by 12. We have not built any breaks into this. Um, there are pros and cons to kind of having a bio break in the agenda, but I, I think what we'll do is everyone, you know, kind of take care of whatever you need to during the, um, the workshop. If you need to be snacking like I always am, go ahead, by all means, snack with the sound off. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and John, give you the screen. Do you wanna share a screen or do you wanna just say a few words? Um, yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll share just a couple of slides real quick. Right. Okay, so um, this is our website. Here we go. Um, all right, so thanks, Dave. Um, my name is John Trzynski. I'm the Director of Resilience Planning at CERCA, which is the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation. Um, this workshop today is the first in a series of workshops um, as part of Resilient Connecticut. Um, so for those who maybe aren't familiar with it, um, Resilient Connecticut was um, you know, developed through a grant to the state of Connecticut um, by HUD. Um, HUD had this uh, National Disaster Resilience Competition back in 2014, 2015, following Sandy. Um, Connecticut was successful at, at um, getting one of the grants through the NDRC program. 
And there's two big pieces of the, the state of Connecticut um, program through NDRC. So there's Resilient Bridgeport. That's a, a, a pilot project or a series of pilot projects, um, actual construction and implementation in the south end of Bridgeport. And then um, what we're part of what we're doing today, Resilient Connecticut. And Resilient Connecticut really was um, or is a regional development of a regional plan across Fairfield and New Haven counties. And so part of that developing that plan was to develop the science, um, develop downscaled um, flood risk assessment tools and analysis and you know do some of what we're going to be kicking off today. So developing um, a climate change vulnerability index and really taking a step back and um, using the scientific science and the data that we have to um, assess vulnerabilities across the two counties. Um, so we're doing a number of these workshops in each COG region over the next uh, week or two, and we'll have a, a second set of workshops later this spring as well. Um, so the first year of the project was meant to develop a, a planning framework um, so these were the themes, you know, this, this planning framework is an iterative process. It has been um, and will continue to be, but these are the major themes of the Resilient Connecticut Planning Framework. So we have a, a particular emphasis around, emphasis around TOD. Um, so looking at uh, encouraging, fostering TOD and where TOD potential exists, um, you know, how can we support that? Um, identifying and creating corridors resilient to climate change. So that's something we call resilient corridors. Um, this connection between low-lying coastal areas and upland uh, areas, um, creating opportunities for affordable housing, thinking about um, you know, how we, can we preserve and enhance the quality of life in existing affordable communities, thinking about energy, economic and social resilience, kind of these other elements of you know, what we, what we refer to as resilience, thinking about social equity, um, thinking about the economic resilience of the community, et cetera. Um, increasing the transit connectivity uh, between communities across Fairfield and New Haven County. So again, that goes back to the, the TOD theme. Uh, adapting structures and critical infrastructure of the flood zone to withstand occasional flooding. So, so how can we um, accommodate or protect, or in some cases relocate if, if necessary, uh, critical infrastructure that um, we know will be subject to flooding. And then finally, you know, we can't have healthy communities without healthy ecosystems. So thinking about um, the role of, of nature-based solutions and, and, and so on. Uh, the, the timeline for um, our project runs until uh, May of 2022 currently, and we're in phase two of the, the process. So, um, you know, this phase two part of the project is kind of to do this regional vulnerability assessment and, and kind of understand where we can develop um, uh, pilot projects. And then phase three is going to be focused on actual pilot projects. And we're hoping to have uh, a number of pilot projects that we can do further site scale planning and design for in phase three. So that's kind of the, the quick overview. Um, you know, you can check out our website, resilientconnecticut.ucon.edu to, to learn more about the, the project. And um, I think that's about it. I will turn it back over to Dave and Victoria. And then also I think I will just in the chat um, I'm just going to leave a link to the, the planning framework that was developed if you want to learn more about that and um, kind of get the context of, of how today's workshop fits into that, that overall planning framework. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Just about at 940. So, Victoria, do you want to take the lead on CCVI at this point? There's on me. I think I know where that is by now. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> All right. So, um, yeah, I'll jump right into, I'm going to do a quick presentation on the CCBI, 
a little bit more on, you know, what it is. We've all heard about it, I'm sure, a few times now, but, you know, just kind of walk through it step by step. And then um, I'm going to go over the map product a little bit. Um, we did send out some information. Not sure if folks had some time to look. Um, but just to um, kind of introduce the mapping product that we'll go through um, during the breakout sessions. So let's see here. Okay, the infamous line. Hopefully you can all see my screen. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dave. So, <clears throat> okay, so CCVI, what is it um, and, and how are we going to use it, right? So it's this great tool that we've been developing, um, but let's try to start connecting some of these dots here. So <clears throat> to let you all know that the CCBI wasn't something that just kind of came out of thin air and we started introducing at the COG meetings a few months ago, um, it's being developed um, as using this the C excuse me, the CVI, so the Coastal Vulnerability Index that Circa has developed. Um, so we're, we're basing the CCVI on that. So a lot of similarities, but also some differences, right? We're expanding this tool. Um, so the similarities between the CCVI and the CVI, um, you know, we're using the built social, ecological, climate, and the physical um, contributors, all of those, you know, those factors, those data layers. Uh, we're using the same gridded, it's a 10 acre cell that we're using to convey and display all of this data and all of these numbers. We're using the same equation, so we're looking at sensitivity and exposure and adaptive capacity. Um, and then a lot of the same data we're using, but we're also expanding on a lot of that data. We're moving this entire analysis inland to incorporate riverine communities. Uh, we're including heat and wind into this analysis. Um, and then we're also incorporating a little bit more data, um, you know, not all of the data that uh, we're using inland was, was relevant for the coastal. Um, and then just in general, you know, we're expanding it, of course, because of the heat and the wind. Um, so really building on this tool that Circa has already developed. Um, so what's the, you know, the CVI and the CCVI are essentially the same thing. Um, so, we'll, you know, keep that in the back of your mind. The Circa has developed the CVI viewer also. So it's a more uh, finalized product. So if you were interested, you could take a look at that viewer, um, similar to what we sent the other day. Um, so what is the CCVI, right? So in kind of literal terms, it's a composite of several factors to quantify climate vulnerability. Um, essentially, it just is this what you see to the right, this purple grid, right? So it's a lot of numbers, a lot of different colors, and a lot of grid cells. Um, but what does that mean to stakeholders? What does that mean to you, um, you know, planners, developers, um, you know, whatever role you might play in the region or in your municipality or community? It's a planning tool, um, you know, that you can eventually use to identify the vulnerability drivers. So if we kind of think of the CCVI as a gridded, large 94,000 uh, layer cell, kind of this plane, there's a lot that we can put on top, but there's also a lot that's going on below. So if you're gonna use the CCVI as a planning tool, you might wanna overlay some other tools, right? You're gonna use this in conjunction with some other, uh, some other resources. So maybe you're gonna take a look at these zones of shared risk Right, you're gonna start digging in, you've got your zones, you know what that risk is. Now let's take a look at what some of those drivers of the risk are. Maybe you wanna take a look at your hazard mitigation plan actions or maybe your CRB actions or priority actions that you've already identified. Maybe some are within the zones, maybe some are without of the zones. How are they addressing those vulnerabilities that you're seeing in the CCBI? And then maybe you even wanna utilize some other data points that we haven't included in the CCBI. Um, we can't put everything into it. Some layers are more subjective than others. So for example, soil data. Maybe you have a specific type of project that you're looking at. Now you want to take a look at the different types of soil data, uh, the soil types within certain areas, right? But now there's also a lot going on into that CCVI. So you're looking at all of these other resources on the top, all of these kind of finalized products, but there's a lot, you know, going into it. What's driving these colors? What's driving these, um, you know, different vulnerabilities, sensitivities, and whatnot? We've got people, infrastructure, climate, and ecological, which is kind of what we're going to focus on today. So what makes up the CCVI? Um, in general, we have the equation of vulnerability equals sensitivity plus exposure minus adaptive capacity. But it's important to um, remember that going into each of these three um, you know, contributors, each of these three components, rather, sensitivity, exposure, and adaptive capacity, you know, there's several layers, several data points, several contributors playing into the sensitivity, exposure, and adaptive capacity, kind of driving these final scores. So if we break down these three, um, and I'm gonna start to over inundate you with a lot of different data points, but um, you know, bear with me here. So if we look at sensitivity, uh, we consider that to be the degree to which a built natural or a human system will be impacted by changes in climate conditions. So if we talk about built, 
and social and ecological, which are those main three that we look at in the CCBI. Um, you know, taking a look at these system components, um, how are they going to be impacted? And, you know, they're, we rank everything to the degree of what they can be impacted. Some things are more sensitive, getting a higher ranking, you know, they could potentially be more impacted, uh, while others are less impacted. So they're ranked, say, a one, right? They're less sensitive, um, you know, less, less willing to change in the wake of uh, climate change. So we're going to start with a poll. Um, and Noah can launch that in just a second. So if we take a look at all of these, these are the contributors that we've included in just the sensitivity component. Again, there's a lot of data here. So take just a quick second and look. Uh, we've got the built, sure you can hear my, my dog circling me right now like a shark. Uh, we have the, um, the built sensitivity. So we have different types of infrastructure, railways, uh, bus yards, um, rail yards, right? Some of which is in the flood zone, some which may become inundated. Uh, we have the social uh, social sensitivity components, um, you know, so certain populations, vulnerable populations, some a little more sensitive to climate change uh, flooding impacts than others, and then ecological as well. So take a quick look at that. Noah, if you want to launch the poll, we have a few questions, um, and it, it's kind of lengthy, um, but just scroll through and let us know what you think might be more important, um, which might be a little bit less, or Rather, I want to say contribute a little bit more to sensitivity and contribute a little less to sensitivity. So if you were to take a look at a map, which would you assume um, are kind of playing a larger role or a, um, you know, a lesser role in driving sensitivity in your community and in, in the region? Um, <laughs> Victoria, so, sorry. I, I know you brought this up earlier, but I thought it was fine, um, but I'm not able to send a poll apparently because right. of multiple people logged in. Um, Okay. Um, I wonder if, let me take a quick look and see if I can. If not, yeah. maybe we will, oh, here we go. I guess I can. That's weird. Okay, great. Well, okay. Um, all right, so I'll launch that. Hopefully you all can see that. So like I said, just take a quick second, eat your multiple choice, you know, which do you think might contribute a little more to sensitivity? Which might do you think contribute a little less to sensitivity? Um, and it is a lot, so, you know, don't feel that this is the, uh, you know, I won't grade you all on, on, on how final this, uh, this poll is, but. And we know that we're asking you before we dive into the tool, and that's, that's by design, so we haven't forgotten to show you anything. We, we kind of wanted to get opinions beforehand. Thank we're you. being tricky. It doesn't, on my end at least, it's not, it doesn't appear, I can see the poll, but I can't click on the bar or enter any data. Yeah, you might not be able okay. to as a, because um, you're a co-host. Oh, okay. Just one. But hopefully one. other people can. I can do it, it works. Okay. 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 Thank you. Bearing with us, still, still facing technical challenges. <laughs> Nine months later, we'll get there one day. <laughs> Just give folks a minute or two. I know it's a longer one. Hopefully everybody had coffee to, to prep. I should have just sent that in the prep email. Get a quick caffeine boost before I hit the polls. Okay. Most everybody's getting there. Hey, Victoria, could you remind us what NDDB is? Oh, yeah. So those are the natural diversity uh, database areas, ND, right? Natural diversity, yeah. yeah. Um, so similar, similar to critical habitats, um, you know, those areas that have a, a critical species. Thank you, John. Sure. Species meaning like animals and stuff? Because habitat is more like a flora and fauna, I guess. Right, so the NDDB um, areas, and Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think I sometimes get this confused, are based on um, certain areas where there's, uh, you know, critical or endangered species, 
right? Right, of any kind. Any right, of any, yeah, sorry. All right, give everybody just a few more seconds here. It looks like I think we've got almost everyone who's not a facilitator. All right. Thirteen. All right, that's probably, let's see. Okay, let's show these. <clears throat> All right, so share those results quick. We'll take a quick look. So it looks like most folks think building density, critical facilities, roadway septic systems, those seem to be the top contributors. What we think, um, leased bus yards, rail yards, okay. Um, contributing more for social, taking a look at lack of uh, vehicle, disability, population density, um, and then the ages. Contributing less, average number per household, lack of vehicle, population density. All right, education seems to be the top. Uh, contributing more, we've got land cover. And then contributing least, we've got NDDB. Okay, a few folks think something's missing. So good, let's keep that in the back of your minds um, for the breakouts, great. Okay, so I'll introduce the next one. Let's see here. Um, so we've got exposure. <clears throat> So similar to sensitivity, um, we're taking a look at the degree of stress, but this is a little bit of a different angle here. So <clears throat> the degree of stress that a particular asset is going through <clears throat> with climate variability. Um, so taking a look at the change, um, you know, in the frequency of events. So you can think of this, um, this component is more of, you know, kind of, I'm going to say weather related, but that's in kind of air quotes, because when you see the factors, you'll, the contributors, you'll understand. So taking a look at, um, you know, to what degree, you um, you know, some of these physical components and, um, you know, climate change itself, right? How it's kind of impacting these sensitive um, contributors that you just looked at, right? So we're looking at these climate and these physical exposure components. So we have our flood zones, sea level rise projections, storm surge, tidal range, and then also to the degree of, to the degree, to the, degree of uh, the physical exposure for some areas. So took a look at DEMs. We tried to find pooling areas, whether it was in urban or uh, rural areas. Uh, erosion susceptibility, impervious surface density, and then we've got shoreline change and then some soil drainage properties, which um, you know, would also relate to pooling as well. So I'll throw up another poll, similar to the one that you just took. Again, which do you think uh, might contribute more, which might contribute less? A uh, few less contributors here, so maybe not quite as daunting as, as sensitivity, so this shouldn't take quite as long. Um, and again, you know, are we missing anything? That option's there as well. So if we are, you know, jot that down, keep that in the back of your mind and let us know during the breakouts. And we do understand that the NVCOG towns are not struggling with sea level rise like the shoreline towns. To make the okay. tool consistent, that's obviously a layer that is, is, um, is utilized. And one thing that's important to note is that it doesn't, have, having no, no data point in that layer doesn't skew all the results for NVCOG. It is still something that you know, you can basically zero it out, normalize it so it doesn't affect the, um, right. the results for a city like Waterbury. Thank you. This is why I have to keep notes. I always forget to take notes of the main points I want to hit and I never do. And that's why I've got Dave. <laughs> All right. A few responses. I'll give everybody just another minute here. This is a shorter one. All right, eight, nine, ten. Another few seconds. All right. <clears throat> All right, let's take a look at this one. So <clears throat> which of the climate might contribute more? So it looks like we've got flood zones um, and storm surge kind of coming in at the top, uh, which contribute less. Tidal range looks to seem, seems to be the clear winner. 
Uh, more for physical, we've got impervious surface density uh, coming in at number one with some soil drainage properties. Um, and then less, we've got pooling areas and shoreline change rate. So, okay. Thank you, got some good results there. And then the last, um, the last component we have is adaptive capacity, right? So sensitivity and exposure kind of look at, um, you know, uh, kind of those negative aspects of climate change, what's going to be impacted, what's going to change. But we can't forget, um, you know, all of these uh, infrastructural and system components that, you know, help us rebound and help us uh, cope, right? So adaptive capacity is the ability of a system to adjust to changes, manage damages, take advantage of opportunities, and cope with these consequences. So similar to sensitivity, we have built and social and ecological. Um, so again, taking a look at those, you know, what are some of the built components, uh, contributors and the social and the ecological contributors. So I'll put the poll up and while I put that up, um, I'll explain a couple of these, um, a couple of these built as well. So let's see, adaptive capacity. All right. So I launched that poll. Um, you know, so for example, in the built, we have regulatory programs. So that might include programs such as the CRS. Um, right, so these are programs that aren't directly related to adaptive capacity, um, but they kind of bolster a community's ability to, you know, implement certain regulatory programs or, um, you know, certain standards to, to help improve adaptive capacity. Uh, riverine and coastal structures, right, so flood protection, taking a look at the distances to um, facilities that help with adaptive capacity or help with, um, you know, event uh, recovery. Um, let's see, flood policies enforced. We Hold on. We took a look at um, we took a look at how many policies are in force in comparison to how many buildings are in the flood zone. Communication systems. So, for example, whether you're on a state system or if a municipality doesn't have any sort of emergency system. Um, and then I think right. And then op open space and flood zones. So, taking a look at how much open space uh, a community has in their flood zones. So, I'll give you all a minute for that poll. And Victoria, these are all with respect to flooding, right? Just yes, yes, thing. yep. Because the CCVI will have heat and uh, wind. Correct, thank you, thank you. Yes, you're all bringing up good points that I keep forgetting, right? All this is in regard to flooding, since that will, that's what we'll be focusing on today. Um, thanks, Joanna. Teamwork makes the dream work. Right, <laughs> especially when I have a giant yellow lab yelling at me in the background, so. <laughs> Give everybody just another minute on that one, and then we'll take a quick look at the map viewer before we jump into the breakouts. All right, just another few seconds here. All right, let's take a look at these poll results here. I think we've got just about everybody. <clears throat> All right, so which do you think contribute more? So it looks like it's a pretty even spread across the board with sewer, sewer ser service areas um, contributing the most potentially. Uh, the least, we're looking at coastal structures. Let's see, social contributing more, taking a look at flood policies enforced with the least um, owner-occupied housing. And then those ecological, we've got, looks like a fair split between open space and flood zones and resilient landscapes. Um, and then contributing least, we've got marsh migration. So, which I guess maybe in different COGS, we might have slightly different results there with the coastal contributors, but it's, it's, it's great feedback, so thank you. So, all right. 
close out my polls here. All right, so let's take a quick look at the map. I know we're going to start running into the breakout time, so I don't want to take up too much time because I want to leave ample time to chat. Um, but if you were, if you didn't have time to um, take a look at the map, that's okay. Um, well, again, we'll we'll have time to also, um, you know, kind of zoom around a little bit in uh, the breakouts. But you know, so for the future and and for the discussion of this, uh, the breakout. You know, so again, we've got this grid cell. We've got several numbers that are going into these uh, into these layers. So right now, we're looking at the overall flood vulnerability score, right? So we've got this combination of our sensitivity, our exposure, and our adaptive capacity. Um, so we want to know, you know, what are the scores, right? Um, let's see. There's our. We have our, you know, our legend. So we've normalized this data. So it's on a scale of zero to one. One being, you know, the most vulnerable. Again, kind of air quotes. A lot of this is, um, you know, this is preliminary data. We're 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 finishing this tool. Um, and then again, a lot of this is kind of based on some degree of assumption, right? Um, again, that's why you want to use this tool uh, with other tools. So. We've got these darker areas, kind of try to focus on the NV cog here, darker areas, lighter areas, but we want to know, you know, what's driving this overall vulnerability score. So we can click on an area and, you know, we can show us these independent values, these independent scores for all of the, um, you know, all of those kind of sub contributors, what's going on in the vulnerability. Or we can take a look at one independent factor, right? So maybe a community wants to say, all right, how can we become more adaptive, right? So we can take a look at our adaptive capacity, same thing, the darker um, is a high score, but in this case, it means a little bit better, right? So um, the darker areas would be a number five, so it will say slightly more adaptive. So that could be, you know, you have some riverine structures, um, you know, maybe you have some stronger regulatory programs or, or an increased number of flood policies. So again, you click on that, you know, we can take a look at what's driving that adaptive capacity and maybe, you know, what might need some improvement. Um, and it's the same with sensitivity and then it's the same with exposure as well. So there's not much to go over with this tool. It's just, um, you know, good to kind of familiarize, um, familiarize yourselves with it quick just while we're, you know, just before we jump into the breakouts. Um, and again, it, you know, it looks, it, there's a lot of different colors and a lot of different numbers going on, but um, that's okay, right? It, I don't want everybody to kind of get caught up in the, the very specifics of the numbers and the equation and, you know, kind of the statistics behind it. Um, you know, kind of look at this from a larger bird's eye view of, you know, the patterns of the colors and the darker colors and the lighter colors and, and what that means. And then you can take a look at, you know, what's driving it, right? What are those higher numbers and lower numbers? Um, so we'll do a few minutes of a report out, um, and then we'll jump into zones of shared risk. Uh, I can go ahead for group A um, and just kind of give a synopsis of what we talked about. We did, we had a chance to look at the overall flood vulnerability scores and some of the colors, and we looked at the drop down box to look at the, the individual numbers that go into that. We also had a chance to look at sensitivity and exposure and adaptive capacity separately. And we mostly focused on Waterbury, but we also looked at Southbury because Carol uh, Haskins was kind enough to answer some questions and be picked on. Um, so we wanted to look at Southbury as well, which is where the Pomp Brown River Watershed is, uh, Coalition is, is headquartered. And also a lot of the work is done in Southbury along the river. Um, so some of the things that we, we talked about um, you know, in terms of how this could be used as a planning tool, I asked a question about, you know, would one go into the individual layers in this tool and kind of look at the census data and the social vulnerabilities, or, or would somebody kind of go directly to that data? It did seem like there was um, a potential use for using this tool to dive into some of those data sets, because it might be easier to get uh, quickly, sort of on the run, than getting census data uh, directly for social vulnerabilities. We talked about whether or not um, exposure was aligned with flood zones and looked at examples in Waterbury and Southbury. Uh, I posed a question, a random question about, um, would you use the impervious services factor turned on in, in the tool for exposure to kind of site uh, green infrastructure or a rain garden? And it seemed like maybe yes, that could help, but there's other information that's kind of as important or more important to deciding you know, where to put, where to reduce imperviousness such as what land is publicly owned. Uh, we had a comment about changing the transparency so things are sort of more visible. That's a really good comment. 
and, and everybody should feel free to offer um, aesthetic comments, not just technical. Uh, we looked at the variability of adaptive capacity in Southbury, you know, why that would be when it's all really one town. And we kind of talked about some of the factors that, that influence it. Um, and then the hillsides in, in Southbury, you know, kind of showed up as a, as a different color than the floodplains. And that does make some sense in the overall score. So we talked about maybe it would make sense to, to bring in some of those other visuals um, and overlay so you can kind of see why that's occurring. Last thing in my report out, we had a question from Deb about um, will these scores ever be used or could they be used kind of to prioritize funding uh, for projects? And so I started to answer, but felt panicked because the clock was ticking about going to the main room. So I didn't finish, um, but it's a really good question. You know, the, there's been a lot of discussion about the scores themselves, the numbers, and we don't see them as being used um, as they are in absolute values of them. We would sort of look at them more um, as relative scores and to be used for planning. So I think the answer is a little bit of both. The answer is a little bit yes. You could, I could foresee an application for a project for funding where you do talk about the scores in this tool and, and overall, you know, how the, how the area appears uh, in the CCVI, but you wouldn't want to hang your head on it. You'd want to have something else as well in your application. And then if anybody from Circo wants to, to add to that, I would, that'd be fine. I was going to note, this is a uh, Joanna from Circa. I was just going to note that one of the things that are coming out of the GC3 is incorporating climate change um, and resilience into different state grant programs. So we hope that this tool will be able to be a way for uh, communities to be able to interpret what's going on. And just like Dave said, having sort of a context, context to what is happening in your community. And then just as the state makes other decisions, incorporating some of this information into your plan of conservation and development or natural hazard mitigation plan are ways to reinforce the uh, other planning priorities for your municipality or region. A group B. Um, we, had, we had some uh, similar themes. We we're a little bit more uh, scattered, but I think um, I identified eight things that we talked about uh, out of the, of the components, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Um, the group, uh, I believe we had somewhat of a consensus that exposure is the most apparent and the, the one that planners focus on the most. So by supplementing exposure with, with looking at adaptive capacity and sensitivity, there, there could be some value there. Um, we talked about uh, specifically riverine structures uh, along the Naugatuck and the COD, or, I'm sorry, I'm mixing things, along the Naugatuck and how they were factored into the adaptive capacity um, layer, how they could be factored in. Uh, I think what Joanna was just alluding to, we also talked about that the, the tool overall might be very useful in ranking and, and assisting with ranking of projects for different uh, different funding programs, not just mitigation, but transportation and other types of competitive funding programs. We talked some about overlaying with flood zones to to identify or differentiate the risk within the zone to potentially find uh, factors that would prioritize one area of a of a one percent. And floodplain over over a different area. Um, we had a, a brief discussion a discussion about adding brownfields as a contributor uh, to the tool. Uh, we similar to that. We talked about prioritizing public works projects and some challenges associated with that. Not surprisingly, funding the biggest one. Uh, and then we had a discussion about critical abilities and how they were identified and. What, what that term means to different people and, and kind of the difficulties with finding consistent data. And then lastly, we ended with a discussion about how do we, or did we include, or could we include uh, planned large future projects into the, into the tool? And I don't know if, if Victoria or on or uh, Katie, if you have anything to add. Got it. Okay. 
Okay. Great. We'll just kind of go through some of the history of, of the concept and, and why, what it means and, and what we're planning to do next. And then we'll dive into the viewer tool. So, um, you know, it used to be that the biggest sin in a presentation was having a lot of words. That was when we were all in a room together and the people in the back couldn't see. Um, so we've kind of let ourselves get a little bit um, crazy with the number of words on the screen and I'm guilty of that as well. But I thought this is a good place to not cut any words because there's a good basis for describing zones of shared risk in a lot of the background material from Resilient Connecticut. And it would be, you know, we, we wanna be mindful of, of that as we kind of work through phase two. So um, the second bullet in particular, the planning approach, which is fundamental to Resilient Connecticut, connects to zones of shared risk with resilience corridors to make our communities more resilient, right? So zones of shared risk are a fundamental part of this project, understanding what they are, where they are, and what it means. Um, so there, you've seen this definition before, there are regions that face common challenges, um, climate related, uh, the term was coined for a more coastal setting, but it certainly works in riverine settings as well. So the zone can include the houses, the people, the land, the infrastructure, uh, ecological factors, social, et cetera, that kind of contribute and make a place, a have a sense of place. But there's a risk as well. And so a resilience corridor is a concept that uh, fortifies and makes our, our transportation corridors more resilient so that we can move around during, after, disasters and as climate change affects us. And ideally, uh, zones of shared risk would be, you know, addressed to some degree with resilience corridors. A lot of the, so people are surprised, I think sometimes to, to hear that the term zones of shared risk goes back nine years when we were first working us and the Nature Conservancy and Yale um, with the town of Guilford on the Coast Resilience Plan. And, Early on, there were four types that were defined. So a location zone of shared risk is, means pretty much what it sounds like. So it's a zone of shared risk by virtue of being located in a flood zone or an area of storm surge or future flood. Whereas an access zone of shared risk, those people might not be located in the flood zone, but their ability to get to, a, to or from where they live, maybe to a shelter, is impaired by current or future flooding. So location and access are two kinds. And then proximity zones. Um, so these are areas that may be adjacent to, um, and so they've got maybe a different kind of risk profile, but they're certainly not far removed. Um, and so they may have some vulnerabilities kind of going forward as climate changes. And then natural protection zones of shared risk are the areas that help buffer us from hazards. So maybe the tidal wetlands uh, in front of a housing development. And they, they are kind of their own zone of shared risk because um, their existence is also threatened, but they also help us be more resilient. So the four types of zones of shared risk, um, it's, it's back there in the history and important to kind of remember. Here's a map for Guilford that was produced back in 2012, 2013. So you can just see kind of some of the areas. So um, the SV on the right-hand side is an industrial park in Guilford with, with a, a creek and tidal wetlands running through the center of it. So those properties flood regularly. And then if you look down at Station's Head at the bottom of the screen, so that's a zone of shared risk by virtue of having isolation risk because a lot of those homes uh, sit higher. So again, just a kind of a, a, an, an older graphic that shows zones of shared risk. And the benefits of kind of having this concept come out of the Guilford planning was that uh, it set kind of the, the precedent for having a spatial scale to, to conduct planning that's smaller than the town. Um, but it's also kind of based on a systems approach. So, so what makes up a zone of shared risk? It's, it's several different things that contribute to the system, but they also imply that there is kind of a social institution or community um, capacities that can help reduce risk within a zone. So a zone of shared risk might be uh, next to a shelter and another one might be further away. And there's kind of an implication of relationship to distance to the shelter a little bit like we were just, just talking about with the CCDI. Um, Circa has picked up on this work and a lot of work has been done through, the, through phase one of Resilient Connecticut into phase two before the consultant team was even involved. Some mapping for New Haven is pictured here. Uh, Peter Minuti's team at UConn uh, 
to use this map so you can see that these are flood based zones of shared risk. So aligned with or near flood zones, coastal or riverine. And some other work from Peter's group in Milford. And I think, you know, what's, what's interesting about the difference between these two graphics is that one doesn't need to sit down and spend hours drawing a zone of shared risk. It may be as simple as kind of identifying an area and then setting it aside to kind of think about later. So, you know, these, these ovals in, in Milford are what's more important than their exact boundaries and shape is the areas that they're identifying, which are, have four different kind of risk profiles, even though they're all coastal, um, they kind of experience the hazards in different ways. Uh, Circa had put together a slideshow that many of you have seen on zones of shared risk from about six months ago. And it kind of goes through the methodology um, to date and provides some examples, which are on the lower right-hand side, Bridgeport and um, Bridgeport is, is pictured here. These are examples from Madison and Guilford. And what's interesting about this example um, from Circa's portfolio is that it spans the town line. I haven't even showed you the town line here between Guilford and, and Madison, but Circle Beach Road is, is more in Guilford and Neck Road is more in Madison. And they are together though, experiencing some of the same uh, climate induced risks and coastal hazards. So uh, what would you do? Would you draw one zone of shared risk or maybe separate zones of shared risk or maybe would you nest one inside the other? Those are different decisions to make you know, as we're drawing zones of shared risk. And the presentation from Circa continued on with um, describing how it's a tool for planning and had some other examples that was here in the lower right. Norwalk. So suffice to say, there's been, you know, been a significant amount of background um, talking about how to draw zones of shared risk. And so our job in the consultant team is to kind of now take this and complete the work. It's been done for a couple towns. You saw Guilford, Milford, and New Haven, but we need to go ahead and identify zones of shared risk in other communities. This word bubble on the right-hand side, I think is great because it, it's really a summation of all of the discussions that have occurred all the narratives that have already been put in place over the past nine years about zones of shared risk. And you can see some of the big words, resilient, land, plan, coastal. And those are, those are themes that kind of still are, they still hold true in the zone of shared risk theory. So we want it to be consistent with work that's already been done. We want it to be, have a tool that was effective in coastal areas as well as riverine. This is a, this, Workshop today is for NVCOG, largely riverine, not coastal flood risks, except down in the latter part, uh, part of Shelton. We wanted this method to be repeatable, result in zones of shared risk that were somewhat blind to social vulnerabilities. That's definitely a factor in the CCBI, but we should, we should be drawing, I think it's appropriate to draw a zone of shared risk in a wealthy part of Guilford, as well as uh, a part of New Haven where there are challenges they should they're both kind of um, deserving of having a zone of shared risk drawn. What you do about it later is kind of a different, a different discussion. Um, and we wanted to make sure we had zones that considered other climate related hazards. We looked at reviewing, we reviewed automated GIS methods and realized that that really wasn't the way to go. Uh, things like network analysts are available to help us understand distance from a hospital or a shelter, but there's a lot of nuances associated with Connecticut's geography. Um, that are kind of harder to capture. Uh, with, uh, you can't just click start in GIS and have it draw the, the zones for you. So it's really important that it's guided through user knowledge, for example, looking at existing hazard mitigation plans and then aided by stakeholder engagement, which is you know, kind of what we're doing right now. So we came up with some potential criteria. We thought a zone of shared risk should, be, should include or be adjacent to buildings, critical facilities, important roads, uh, arterials, et cetera. So this would not neglect a tidal wetland because the tidal wetland would be adjacent to these things. Um, what does this neglect? Well, maybe um, if we were trying to do this in the Northwest corner of the state, there might be a large part of the state forest um, where there aren't any buildings, there isn't a severe flood risk um, and, and nature isn't buffering us. So that might be an area where you would not draw as an insured risk, but certainly a lot of other ideas here for where to draw them. Um, we thought that it might be appropriate for a zone of shared risk to, to include or be near uh, a shelter um, or a heating cooling center or medical facilities, or maybe it, there's a lack of those facilities. 
that one would use to draw the zone of shared risk. Similarly, uh, a lot of our infrastructure and utilities, so vulnerable transmission or distribution or lack of redundancy, um, lack of generators for standby power, history of frequent outages, and then water and wastewater utilities. And I think we're about to lose Steve, lose Steve Wallet from DPH, but he has been on the call. So um, Steve, we're letting you know that we're looking at, at water utilities and lack of water utilities as part of this as well. But we're not showing the boundaries today of the, the pipes in the road. And we also wanted to look at heat um, as a potential type of zone of shared risk. And we've, we're really intrigued with where those would overlap with the flood based zones of shared risk. So there's a few tools out there right now to kind of ascertain uh, urban heat index. Uh, the one that I pictured right here is, is Yale's viewer. You can go online, the, the link is right there. We can make sure you have it later on. Then you can kind of look at what, um, what the urban heat exposure would be. This view right here is Waterbury. Oops, my mistake, I just um. And then a uh, wind, we wanted some wind influence zones of shared risk. This is a really hard one to get at. You know, if you look at an Eversource outage map, it's gonna show you the whole town. It's kind of hard to dive into the details. Um, and that some of that information is certainly not accessible, it might be private. But we looked at the hazard mitigation plans and we found statements from the NVCOG towns, for some of the NVCOG towns about where wind damage has kind of been more of a persistent problem. So like in Waterbury, uh, we heard perhaps the town plot area. Remember, this is not a quantitative um, process drawing zones of shared risk. So it is okay to hear something that includes three words, town plot area. We can, we can work with that. So I'm just gonna show you the viewer tool and, um, oops. Get that up. I should still have it open. Yep, there it is. And and we'll be looking at this in more detail during the, um, the breakout sessions. Okay. So this is uh, this is Waterbury that it's open to. I'll I'll zoom out for a second. You can see that we have um, NVCOG loaded. We've been working with the other COGS as well, but I think we, we hid those layers just for the sake of, of getting through today. Um, so Waterbury down to Shelton. Um, this work has been focused on the Central Corridor towns. Um, so if you're on the call from Prospect or Watertown and you don't see yourselves having zone of shared risk mapping, that is because we're, we focus the effort on towns that have TOD potential. Um, if you were in the beginning of our meeting back at 9.30, John spoke about you know, the, the project really um, having affordable housing, TOD, resilience corridors, our central concepts to resilient Connecticut. So that's kind of where we focus the zone of sharing risk. And let's see, I think that's starting at 11. I'll just take you through a couple things um, real quick. Uh, the color coding is, is nothing, um, Complex red are the areas that the Yale tool shows a higher risk for urban heat, island impacts. Yellow are the areas where we heard there was some enhanced potential for, for wind damage. And then the greens are the flood-based zones of shared risk. And they are largely aligned with floodplains, but not always. And what I mean by that is some floodplains do not have a zone of shared risk drawn for them. And some zones of shared risk that are flood-based don't have a floodplain or stream visible inside of them. A really good example is downtown Waterbury. The hazard mitigation plan talks a lot about um, the streams that uh, come out of Fulton Park and Great Brook flow in culverts, but have caused some flooding in the past in this part of Waterbury. So it would it made sense for us to draw a zone of shared risk here because the buildings and the people that are in this area kind of share that that risk of not being able to see the stream but have experienced some flooding. A couple other things that we have visible, um, we've got critical facilities. Um, so you can see you know, rail, bus, police, fire. Um, the brown dots are historic resources, which is a really good data set that's available from our friends at the State Historic Preservation Office. So you can see areas of historic resources, historic buildings. We've got natural diversity database polygons turned on in this case, and the flood zones, of course. 
by the greenish color. So um, why, why are some flood zones not identified as zones of shared risk? I, I'll give you kind of a really good example over here in the southwest part of Waterbury. Um, this is flood control land set aside after the 1950s floods. I think this is Hopbrook. Um, so not a lot of buildings um, or structures in here. We're not relying on these areas to directly protect us from flooding, they, even though it is a flood protection area. Um, so it, it's not necessary to kind of identify it as um, an area where risk needs to be addressed. And there are other areas, flood zones, where we haven't identified um, zones of shared risk. Another example, continuing to pick on Waterbury. So we have not identified the Mad River along the shopping malls and I-84. The reconstruction of I-84 has opened up a lot of conveyance through here, which hopefully will help um, alleviate flooding, flooding risks. Uh, certainly, Brass Mill Mall is still in, in partly in a flood zone. And one could make the case that that may be appropriate to draw a zone of shared risk. Uh, but for the moment, we haven't uh, done that. And so I think one thing we can get at in the breakout rooms is, is kind of going through the thought process of what should be zone of shared risk. So um, before we go into the breakout rooms here in a couple minutes, I believe we're on time. Yes, are there any kind of uh, questions about this? Broad questions. And we'll take a, a deeper dive and go through all the towns in the breakout rooms. I'm sort of just stepping through them right now. Oh, one more comment. So where we've used different color greens, a darker green and a light green, that's just to help help the eye out. We have nested zones of shared risk. So smaller areas of risk that are different than the larger area that they're in. And so we use kind of a different color green for some of those to help um, just make it easier to see them. Okay. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Okay. Dave, um, do you want to stay? So I guess I'll go ahead. Okay. Yeah. It's me. Um, so we had a what my team is calls coming while I'm on Zoom. Um, we had a good discussion about zones of shared risk in general and talked about some specific things that I was not, um, that I didn't think would come up and I was glad that they came up. So one of the items was the, the wind risk. So getting those drawn and, and what sort of data sources are out there. And, um, you know, Carol brought up a good point about the 2018 tornado and microburst that really affected the region. South Ferry in particular, but went across the whole region. And um, you know, kind of, we talked about how to get, kind of get better data from Eversource or other, other people that might have it, maybe focusing on substations um, in, in, in the areas that they serve, that sort of thing. Uh, Carol also had a really good point about private well data and how there's been kind of a want for uh, better spatial data for, for areas that lack public water systems and use private wells. And uh, there's been some work in that in that realm, but there's more work to be done. And I mentioned how that could really affect zones of shared risk. You know, we may we may we may draw an area that has a risk, which is because of a risk risk to private wells. And I mentioned Meadowbrook Manor in, in Brookfield, which was an area that undertook a flood mitigation project to address private wells outside the region, but kind of a handy example. We talked about kind of the transportation corridor lens being a, a helpful way to, to think about zones of shared risk. Um, and we talked a little bit about, you know, how the tool can be used um, for future hazard mitigation plans, uh, for helping focus state agency you know, initiatives, and maybe addressing grant programs, um, maybe looking at potential criteria for uh, developing transit-oriented areas. You know, are there things that we should be um, using as kind of a screening level uh, before we do that? And uh, lastly, I, I 
picked on Richard and asked him how he could maybe use this data in his work in NVCOG. And he said he was working on uh, the build out, regional build out. I thought that was an interesting project coming up that you know, could be overlaid with the CCBI and zones of shared risk. Back to group B. Do you want to take Scott, yeah, I, I, thanks. Um, we started off the discussion um, talking about regionally important facilities uh, that might not be in included in our study area. Uh, the example of the, the Waterbury bus terminal is in Watertown was one that came up. Um, there's similar examples with, with water supply. Um, so the importance of kind of factoring in those regional things that might not be within our focus area comment was made about um, when we were talking about planning, uh, pr practical planning uh, uses, that it would be useful for open space planning and prioritization potentially. Um, it, and there was thought that while it could inform the type of development that might be proposed or could help uh, direct development, it's probably more for, a, again, a planning tool for grant planning than it is for you know, citing or making specific development decision, sort of a, a tool to, to provoke you to look a little bit deeper. Um, we had uh, some discussion about whether it would be useful, Katie asked if it would be useful to have more of a participatory process and how some of these items uh, did evolve from that in the hazard mitigation planning process, but there was agreement that if we had the time to, to do that, um, you know, there's examples of smaller areas that could possibly be added. And um, we didn't really reach a conclusion, but we talked about that. Um, talked some about coordinating with, with town or uh, surrounding towns. We also talked about how to, you know, when we're, when we're sizing and looking at how we draw these, uh, whether there's a benefit to tighten them up, for example, with flooding based on topography maybe, or how do we address ones such as uh, the, the TOD in Naugatuck and how do we portray the fact that that impacts the, uh, the zone really includes prospect and surrounding areas. And, you know, similarly to the, some of the zones in Waterbury that have those impacts on town. So we, we concluded racing against the clock with a brief discussion about, you know, do we, do we put a zone around a pumping station, but then attribute it with a description of who is impacted or do we draw the zone around the entire impacted area? So we got down into, into some of those weeds. Um, God, or Katie, or, or anything to add to that? No, I think that, I think that captures what we, what we discussed. Uh, take us back to um, our slides. And, all right. So we are wrapping up. We have um, three more of these, which will be, uh, I'm sure they're all going to be different from one another. One is for uh, West Cog, which is on Monday. And then we have one for Scrog and then one for Metro Cog. Um, you know, all, all regions that have kind of their own sets of concerns. And um, there'll be continued engagement throughout Resilient uh, Connecticut Phase 2. But what we're going to be doing in the short term is trying to um, incorporate feedback into the CCVI and the zones of shared risk from this workshop and from the others. Um, and I do feel like despite, you know, sort of the day being a little bit quiet, I got some really good ideas from the discussion today. So I we plan to incorporate that. We, you know, looking for further ahead, um, I kind of threw this, this timeline on the bottom, not detailed, it takes you from 2020 to 2021. Um, it, we've taken various things that we've talked about today, utilities, infrastructure, social vulnerabilities, and we have used it to, which we've shown you how we've used it to build the CCBI, which has those three main contributors, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity, each with individual contributors among those. 
but we've also used those factors for, um, and so that's gonna be used for a planning tool, but we've also used those factors for the zones of shared risk. And if you've been asking yourself over the course of the last two hours, why uh, this CVI and the zones of shared risk have kind of been running in parallel, um, well, there's kind of a, a crazy brilliance to that, which is that they kind of come at vulnerability and risk differently. And now it's our job to bring them together and help prioritize um, zones of shared risk to identify opportunities and projects uh, for resilience, um, projects that can help the state as a whole become more resilient. So that's happening you know, after these workshops towards the spring uh, as we step through uh, resilient Connecticut phase two. Um, we have just a couple reminders of how to provide feedback. You know, most of these are methods that have already been in place, but um, Victoria sent out a brief survey before today's workshop. That is still you know, a possible way to provide some feedback on the tools we looked at today. You can always reach out to us directly, um, email, phone. The story map is something that um, is not quite out yet, but I think about to be released for, for phase two of Resilient Connecticut that'll have methods of providing feedback. Many of you on the call have been in some of our meetings with the COG boards and committees. There will be additional opportunities like this one, webinars, et cetera. And um, you know, this last question is really geared towards folks on the phone like, like Carol and Lori and Jim Stewart. Um, you know, if you feel like this is something that you want to be brought to one of your commissions or agencies, um, let us know. We're looking for more ways to kind of interact and, um, and explain what's going on. So that I believe is, that's everything. Um, John, do you want to have any parting words? <coughs> Um, no, I think this was, uh, this was useful at kind of, you know, trying to ground truth some of these tools. And I think, um, you know, I know I have a lot of thoughts about, um, you know, how, how we can move forward. I think, you know, the purpose of this project is ultimately is not about tools. You know, the tools are a means to an end, which is, you know, kind of like under better understanding and better informing, um, you know, our understanding of what the climate change impacts are going to be and then developing projects that will help, you know, the state and the region mitigate those things. Um, so I think in general, if there's feedback about um, whether the things are useful or not useful, I think that's really helpful for us to hear at this stage. And I think, um, you know, as I mentioned, it's going to be an iterative process over these next couple of months. I don't know if anybody else has thoughts from Circa or from the team. I would just say, oh, I cut in on you. I, I just think that one thing that could be really useful um, is once these four meetings are done with each of the COGS to, for our team to identify some of the common themes that we've heard between each of the meetings, because you know each region is gonna be different and characterized in different ways and people have different priorities but there probably are gonna be some common threads and themes. And so I think that'll be a useful exercise and your input today, I think has been really helpful for your particular region. Um, and we'll, I think maybe circle back at the next workshops to ha maybe have that be part of the debrief. Um, you know, we're talking to each, each region individually, but you know, linking them together in some, some way, I think is, is uh, potentially a useful exercise as we finish these next three workshops. I was just going to say, we do have time. We set aside time. If anybody wants to give any, you know, final feedback or, um, you know, if there's any other overall questions regarding any of the tools or anything else we um, we brought up today. So we did we did leave time for that. I want to make sure if, if uh, you know, folks want to share their thoughts that uh, on anything that we can. I don't have any specific questions, but. useful, not useful? Could we have, you know, provided any other information maybe that, you know, we didn't and would have been helpful for conversations, anything like that? If not, I guess we can break early for lunch. <laughs> All right. 
Yeah. Well, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks.